Are you done right now, Dave? You okay? <laughs> <laughs> when I suggested to uh, Jim Comey backstage that he didn't really need an introduction, he said, no, no, actually, I want one. <laughs> And he'll be back. He'll be back in just a moment. Um, Jim has served this department uh, also, like Kathy, in so many ways as an AUSA in the Southern District of New York and in the Eastern District of Virginia, as the Deputy Attorney General, and now as, a, the, as the Director of the FBI. My privilege and pleasure to welcome my friend Jim Comey. I was so worried that we'd have one of those awkward moments and show up wearing the same thing. <laughs> Luckily, he decided to pretend to be somebody else today. Um, when I was Deputy Attorney General, like my predecessors and my successors, I would sit at one end of that long oval glass table, and at the other end, I would see this. And the only thing I didn't do to this, because these are actually items owned by my family, is put the sampling of Washington's best bargain uh, restaurants all over it. <laughs> Someone told me David tried to give some of his old clothes to Goodwill, and they returned it because they don't take food donations. <laughs> uh, so I look down the end of the table, again, like so many dags before and after me, and I see this. But sometimes packages and wrappings can be deceiving, because on, on those days when he was oriented as to time and place, <laughs> he had something to add. He really did. Uh, we teased him a lot about his clothes, uh, but we have to acknowledge at the 50-year mark some serious contributions. It was you, David, who made the earth tone velour leisure suit work. <laughs> it was you who brought back the v-neck sweater worn backwards. <laughs> you enriched our lives in ways that we have forgotten. <laughs> but down to the end of that table, I came to call him the career official. Right? You remember that? Because we would give all the hairballs to the career official. All the hardest, as you heard, most difficult problems, the most politically controversial, we gave them to the career official. And there's a reason we did that. I think it was Emerson who said, it's easy in the world to live after the world's opinion. It's easy in solitude to live after one's own. But the great man is he who, in the midst of the crowd, keeps with perfect sweetness the independence of solitude. David Margolis is a great man. Uh, inside that weird, sometimes asleep packaging <laughs> was someone who stood in the midst of a crowd and always, always maintained with perfect sweetness the independence of solitude. Uh, I like to talk about the, the trust and credibility that underlies this great institution as a reservoir, uh, and I use that metaphor because I think it captures how long it takes to fill uh, and the danger in a reservoir. Right? It's filled bucket by bucket by promises made and kept, mistakes made and admitted and fixed. It takes generations to fill. The danger in it is one hole in the dam can drain the entire thing. David Margolis filled that reservoir for us, I hope for our children, our grandchildren, bucket by bucket, promise by promise kept, mistake made and admitted and fixed for 50 years. That is a tremendous gift. But he was something else. He was the guardian of that reservoir. He was the patrol force around that reservoir. He circled it seven days a week to protect it so that we can benefit from it and pass it on to those of us who follow. I don't know what we'll do without him, honestly. But while he's still with us, uh, I think it's a great opportunity to celebrate what you have earned for us, what you have protected for us, and what you have done for us. We love you, and thanks for what you've done for the department.
I'm going to ask the uh, folks on the stage to take seats in the front row now and invite all of you to enjoy a video tribute to David. So if you would give us just a, just a moment to reassemble.
This morning we had a uh, spectacular and official swearing-in ceremony for uh, Attorney General Loretta Lynch to make this ceremony official today. It's my honor to introduce the 83rd Attorney General of the United States, Loretta E. Lynch. Good afternoon, everyone. Just another day at Justice, two parties. <laughs> uh, but I am so delighted to be here to join you to celebrate the outstanding career and indeed the legacy of David Margolis. It is indeed my honor to be here to present him with a pen to mark this outstanding achievement. I thought, of course, that the music for the video was so perfectly appropriate as it began because we all know that David Margolis is the Yoda of the Department of Justice. <laughs> Sits in his office dispensing wisdom, sartorially challenged. And I'm going to give you a little piece of jewelry that I think will help that out with today. But seriously, David, it is really indeed an honor to be able to present this to you today. For so many years, you have been the conscience of the department. Wise guidance, sage advice, keeper of confidence, repository of trust for friends, for colleagues, for attorneys general. And we thank you more than we can say. You can look in the program and see David's storied career, and he's had so many titles. But as someone who has guided me through not only two tours as U.S. Attorney, but my most recent return to the Department of Justice, the title that I am most happy to use when I think of David is friend. So David, please come forward. It gives me great honor to present to you this pin recognizing your contribution to the Department of Justice. It's very small. It can never signify the space that you hold in our hearts and the contributions you've made. It's just a small token of our appreciation. So thank you for everything. But I'm not the only one recognizing David today. I'm incredibly honored to be able to read this small missive directed his way, which is addressed, Mr. David Margolis, Washington, DC. Dear David, I am pleased to join in recognizing your 50 years of service at the Department of Justice. For half a century, you have dedicated yourself to upholding the laws and ethical standards that define who we are as Americans. Through your commitment to the cause of justice and by working tirelessly to advance our nation's ongoing journey toward a future of greater freedom and equality, you have helped make our country stronger for generations to come. Congratulations on this milestone. As you reflect on all that you have achieved, please know that I remain grateful for your passionate service. I appreciate your continued leadership and I wish you and your family all the best. Signed sincerely, Barack Obama. Any words other than the following at this moment would be inappropriate. Ladies and gentlemen, David Margolis.
Thank you all so much. Uh, but I have a few words to say, maybe more than a few words. A common uh, thread among the uh, leadership's view in the Department of Justice uh, of me over the years, my first boss described me as irreverent. Uh, Attorney General Barr had the same description. And Comey, who has a great way with words on the occasion of my 40th anniversary that he hosted in this great hall, told the Washington Post that when he was full of crap, I would tell him so, and when the Attorney General was full of crap, I would tell him so, too. And uh, Jim told me afterwards that his father-in-law said, is that the way you talk in front of my children, Comey? <laughs> I also know that when you reach the age of 75, you can say just about anything that you want to say because nobody pays any attention to you anyway. So let me test the limits of that principle uh, today. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank our Attorney General for agreeing to arrange her investiture so that it could serve as the opening act to the main event. <laughs> thank you. I want to uh, share with you today a few PG uh, anecdotes and recollections I've gathered over the years. I'm holding back a number of other ones R-rated in reserve for a later time and a later form. So Hyman, Morford, Schmaller, uh, and a host of others uh, can relax for now. <laughs> Uh, Bill Barr was an outstanding attorney general and a legal scholar who headed the Office of Legal Counsel and has long been a loyal member of the DOJ family. Uh, and he's known for his wicked sense of humor. So I, I recall early in the Clinton administration when the new attorney general, Janet Reno, uh, had the honor of presenting his, uh, his portrait, Barr's portrait, in this great hall. She had a reception uh, in her suite afterwards. And I was over uh, in a corner talking to Bill when I noticed out of the corner of my eye that Attorney General Reno was approaching us. Now, she didn't know me that early uh, in her tenure. So as I saw her approaching, I went like this to Bart. Get away from me, you damn Republican. <laughs> I figured that would impress her, but <laughs> it, instead she apologized vociferously to, uh, to Bill and uh, for my comments, and he said, oh, no, no need for apologies. Uh, you'll find that he's your albatross from now on. <laughs> and she confided in me years later that she understood then what he meant. Uh, so it was two years later when I was uh, lying in a hospital bed at GW recovering from my heart attack and quadruple bypass surgery, that the phone rang. I picked it up and I said, hello. And the voice on the other end said simply, I knew those Democrats couldn't kill you. <laughs> it, and it was Barr. Uh, I remember one day my dear friend Charlie Steele called me uh, and asked me if he could come down and talk to me about something. And I, was, I had my door shut, which was uncharacteristic, but I was working on something that I really wanted to finish. So I said, give me a half hour, Charlie, then come down. You'll find the door shut, but don't bother to knock. Just come in, but wait a half hour. So what seemed to be about a half hour later, there was a knock on the door, and I assumed it was Charlie, and I said, come in, you stupid fool. And the door opened, and the head of Deputy Attorney General Mark Phillip appeared. He, and he looked around and he said, say, how did you know it was me through the door? <laughs> now, there are very few people in our culture who are known uh, by only their first name. Uh, Elvis was one, Beyonce is another, uh, Madonna is another. But in this town, if you mention the name Jamie, nobody asks you who Jamie is. They all know it's the bionic babe. <laughs> and she knows I love her. I recall when she was, talk when she was deputy uh, and she was talking about uh, 
the qualities of our office. She said, and I think I've got this almost verbatim, uh, she said, when I'm looking for uh, intellectual firepower, I have Merrick, and I have Seth, and I have Ogden. And then she got to me and she said, well, he is fiercely loyal and absolutely fearless. And I was really pleased by that, and I thought about it afterwards, and I said, what she was really saying is I have more balls than brains, but. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. One of my dearest friends over the last 20 years is Brian Jackson. Uh, and uh, he came, from my, came up here from uh, Louisiana for my 60th birthday and my 40th celebration uh, and today. And if I had to describe Brian in one word, uh, it would be loquacious. And I recall uh, on election night of 2008, as uh, Brian at that time was a successful private practitioner, uh, I sent, as soon as Senator McCain delivered his gracious concession speech, I sent Brian an email that said, how about that? And he responded and said, I'm speechless. And I replied, ah, two firsts on the same night. <laughs> and, and now, uh, I'd love to see Brian whenever he comes up to uh, Washington, but I refuse to go to Baton Rouge where he's now the chief judge of the district court because I know the powers of contempt and I'm not gonna take any chances. <laughs> Back when I was uh, chief of organized crime, a lawyer came in to see me on behalf of a client. He made a presentation that really impressed me and I told him I was gonna rule in his favor and he thanked me and he left. And then through uh, a method I'm not too sure that I understand to this day, I got overruled and I was told to write this lawyer a letter telling him that I'd come out, uh, that the department had come out in an opposite uh, way. And so I, I felt uncomfortable, but I, I sent the letter and I got a blistering response back from the lawyer, uh, all justified, saying, you know, you told me you were gonna do one thing and then you uh, did something else and this is outrageous. So I talked to various people in leadership, telling them I, w I wanted to uh, get back to this lawyer and tell them uh, what really happened. And I was told, no, you know, we're all one department and uh, you, you've never had to deal with this lawyer before. I'm sure you never have to deal with this lawyer again. So just let it ride, don't respond to his letter. So I took that advice and I didn't respond and I went on with my life. Uh, the lawyer's name was Mike Mukasey. <laughs> and I never told him, we read in the paper that uh, he was gonna become attorney general. You imagine my reaction. But <laughs> Fortunately, his memory is nowhere near as good as mine. <laughs> and he treated me great, we had a great time together. And today, uh, uh, this morning when we met privately, for the first time, I told him the story, and he said that he agreed uh, that I shouldn't have told him uh, that I got overruled, that the department is one institution, so I appreciated that. Uh, I also remember one day, about 10 years ago, one morning, I got a call from Bobby Conrad, who was then the U.S. attorney, in, uh, AUS attorney in North Carolina, he's now a district judge, and he was a member of the advisory committee. And he said that the committee, uh, which was in town, uh, had, had dinner the night before, and they decided it would be great to pull uh, a trick on Paul Warner, who was the uh, chair of the committee. So what they wanted me to do was to come down uh, to their meeting that morning and pick a fight with them and insult them, and they would insult me back, and Warner wouldn't know what to do, and it would be a great, great time. So. I said, I said, you know, Bobby, I don't know how wise that is. And he said, well, of course, if you don't have the nerve to do it, we'll understand. So I was there in five minutes. And it, it was rollicking. I remember uh, Mike Hevacan uh, stormed out of the room. Uh, at one point, I said, I don't know why I'm wasting my tongue, time talking to you guys uh, when I could be up in my office doing something important like bidding on eBay. And then the U.S. Attorney from the Eastern District 
of Virginia, Paul McNulty, uh, said something conciliatory. And I responded, now you gotta take advice from the class clown. So eventually, you know, we told Warner what the real story was. And that afternoon, Paul called, Paul called me and said, you know, he hadn't been at the dinner the night before. And he, he didn't know what, what was going on. He thought it was serious. And I said to him, well, you know, Paul, I guess I'm lucky you're not the Deputy Attorney General. <laughs> we, we got along great when he became the Deputy Attorney General. <laughs> One day, uh, I was looking uh, through my personnel file, and I came across a handwritten in pencil buck slip uh, that Jack Keeney had written to Henry Peterson uh, recommending uh, that I be hired uh, for organized crime. This was in early 1969. Uh, as Jack Mulcahy noted, you know, we all had to leave the U.S. Attorney's Office at some point after the election. And I, I wasn't ready to go into private practice, so I applied for a job in organized crime. And uh, here's what Jack wrote. Uh, this candidate dresses like a mobster and wears his hair like Joe Namath, but He's an experienced AUSA, and he comes recommended by John Newman, we should hire him. So uh, I got hired, and I remember my interview with Henry lasted about 30 seconds. I walked in to what later became my office, this huge office, and he said, don't bother to sit down. Uh, this won't take long. I'll give you a grade 13, uh, step one. Uh, where do you want to go? And I said, well, I'll go anywhere. I, at that moment, I was single, and I said, I'll go anywhere that has a Major League Baseball team. Uh, and he said, well, I understand Buffalo is going to get a Major League Baseball team. <laughs> Good luck to you. I actually wound up staying in Hartford, uh, but that, that's a story for a different day. Uh, for, I want to dispel the rumor that's been circulating that Mueller isn't here today because he can't take the thought of being roasted again. And that's simply not true. Uh, as most of you know, Bob is setting up an exclusive uh, practice, a boutique practice, and he's fully occupied in furtherance of that practice this afternoon, chasing ambulances up and down the streets of Washington. <laughs> I've also been told it's no longer politically correct to make fun of wasps. I won't accept that. Uh, so, it, it just against my nature to accept something like that. Uh, I remember when Mueller was uh, the Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division, and I was one of his deputies, he had a staff meeting of his deputies every afternoon, and sometimes it would get uh, raucous, and I would tend to disagree with him on occasion. And once he really frustrated me, and I said, damn it, Mueller, your problem is you have a wasp mentality. And he said, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, for example, I bet you you're one of those guys who steps out of the shower to take a leak. And, <laughs> and, and he looked at me rather puzzled, and he said, well, doesn't everybody? I said, there you go. many of you know, was the Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division, was the United States Attorney uh, in Boston, and was the twice-elected governor of, uh, of Massachusetts. He makes Mueller look like a pauper and a knock-around guy. And I remember during Bill's first campaign for uh, governor, he went down to the wa uh, docks in Boston to work for, uh, to, uh, work for some votes, and one of the workers said to him, Weld, I hear you're rich. How much do you make? And Weld looked incredulous and said, Sir, the Welds don't make money. We have money. <laughs> and so he was a good match for Mueller. Uh, and by contrast, I went uh, to a boarding school, a fine prep school, Loomis, uh, which we'll hear more about in a moment. But uh, uh, I was a day student. 
I remember a few years ago, Weld called me, and he wanted to recommend a candidate, a particular candidate for U.S. attorney. And he said, you probably don't remember him because I understand there are a lot of uh, applicants for that job. And I said, well, I do remember uh, this guy because I noted on his resume that he went to my prep school. And there was a perceptible pause. And Weld said, are you telling me you're a Loomis boy? And he said, that's right, Phil. And he said, well, I must say, you've done a great job of masking that fact all these years. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. And uh, in my profile, I list my occupation as the time and attendance manager for a major nonprofit. <laughs> I do that for. Uh, three reasons. First of all, it's true. I, I do the time and attendance sheets for uh, the component heads that report uh, to the deputy. Uh, second, I know people who know me know it's me, and I don't care about the other people, but it's, it's really the third thing that really matters. It fulfills my lifelong dream. I can now truthfully say I'm the department's TNA guy. <laughs> it took a minute, didn't it? Yeah. And some of you still don't get it, but that's fine. I don't think my grandchildren get it. I, but I'm not sure about that. I also remember uh, Comey's farewell when he left as Deputy Attorney General. Uh, Mr. Rosenberger here was the MC at that event also. And all the component heads uh, came into the deputies' conference room to pay their uh, last respects we hoped uh, to uh, call me. Didn't turn out to be that way. <laughs> they, they all made nice speeches. And at the end, I asked permission uh, to say a few words. And I remember Chuck saying, give him another cookie, sit him down, and shut him up. <laughs> but I, uh, I insisted. So I said that uh, there was an article in the paper that morning about Rod Rosenstein's investiture the day before, and that I had the article with me. I said, and a quoted Rod is saying that his role model uh, for serving as U.S. Attorney would be Robert S. Mueller III. And of course, Jim thought I was putting him on, couldn't believe that that's what Rod would say. So he said, give me that article. And, <laughs> and he read it, and it, that's just what it said. And he stomped around the room bellowing, he is dead to me, he is dead to me. <laughs> On a, on a very uh, personal note, uh, I was very shy when I was young, and as I indicated, I went to a boys' school, so I didn't really have much interaction with girls at a young age and didn't know how to, uh, how to deal with them. And in the summer of 1955, when I was 15 years old, I was in a so an evening softball league at a school uh, in Hartford, and uh, this girl named Debbie Lipman and her girlfriends used to come over and uh, watch us play. And we would talk afterward. And I started to think of her as my girlfriend, my first girlfriend. And then halfway through that summer, uh, she sent one of her friends to me to say, Debbie wants you to hold hands with her. And I said, whoa, wow. Uh, so I finally got up the courage to hold hands with her for the rest of the summer. And then I went back to Loomis in the fall. Uh, in the next summer, summer of 1956, I was now 16, same softball league, same group of girls uh, came to watch. And then one night, uh, her girlfriend told me, Debbie says uh, she wants you to kiss her. Uh, and if you don't kiss her, you know, she won't be your girlfriend anymore. And he said, wow, she's awfully forward. I'm only 16 years old. I don't know. So uh, I couldn't get up the courage. I really couldn't, and uh, she dropped me like a bad habit. And uh, that was in 1956. Uh, fast forward to 1969. Uh, at that point, I was a, an assistant United States attorney, full of confidence and full of a lot of other stuff, too. Uh, I, my name was in the newspaper almost every day. I had two, I was juggling two different girlfriends. And life couldn't be any better. When the U.S. attorney and I would walk down the hallways, the veteran 
uh, uh, federal agents would snicker uh, and say, uh, here comes uh, the Cape Crusader and the Boy Wonder, because Bat the Batman TV show was, uh, was big then. So as I said, life couldn't be better. And I'm sitting in my office one afternoon in uh, January of 1969, and who comes in to see me but Debbie Lipman. And she was a legal secretary in Hartford, and she had to file some papers for her office, in uh, the clerk's office. So she stopped in to say hello. And I said, man, this is my chance. You know, just give her a kiss for the first time. <laughs> I'm ready now. So I walked her down to her car, and she got in, started the engine, and I leaned in for my first kiss from her, and I was so, I guess, excited, uh, I didn't notice that she had the driver's window rolled up. <laughs> I, I wound up kissing uh, a face full of glass. She gave me a strange look and drove off into the sunset. <laughs> Second time. Uh, but I'm happy to say that uh, about four months later, we were married, and uh, she uh, delivered uh, two wonderful daughters uh, to our marriage. Uh, and the three of them, Kim and Sherry and Debbie, followed me uh, from Hartford to Cleveland to Brooklyn to here in Washington so I could uh, continue to tilt windmills on behalf of this great department. And I'm also so pleased uh, that my crew is here today, Nate and Owen and Audrey, the, the light of my life. Uh, on, a, on a serious note, I want to close with uh, this. Over the years when I've been interviewing U.S. attorney candidates, I ask each one of them to pick out an accomplishment they're particularly proud of uh, in their careers. And I think it's only fair for me to answer that question. I, I am proud of our work and accomplishments in organized crime. Oh, I also recognize that a lot of it had to do with being in the right place at the right time, surrounded by talented prosecutors and gifted agents. Uh, but the thing that really has stuck in my mind uh, was a work that I did before I was even old enough to vote. In, those, in my days, you had to be 21 uh, before you could vote. And when I was a student at Brown, I uh, joined the NAACP and worked my, uh, the uh, Brown chapter, and uh, worked my way up to president of the chapter, which made me vice president of the uh, Rhode Island, uh, the whole Rhode Island chapter. And at that time, w one of the biggest issues facing us, the biggest issue, was lunch counter segregation uh, in the Deep South. And uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, there wasn't such segregation, but we were smart enough to know that that's where you put the pressure on because uh, you lead a national chain of three, uh, five and 10 cent stores uh, to change their practices by affecting their pocketbooks. So uh, I led the picketing of those stores in uh, downtown Providence and we were successful. And I'm so proud of that. I remember one day the manager of one of the stores coming out to talk to me and he said you know we don't segregate here uh, why don't you go down to uh, the deep south and protest down there and i said to him sir i'm committed but i'm not crazy <laughs> i also another lesson i learned from that was there, there were police assigned to make sure uh, that we weren't uh, assaulted because it was not the most popular action around. And I remember thanking a police officer and him saying to me, the law says you have a right to do this and my job is to enforce the law. And I have no doubt that he didn't agree uh, with what we were doing, but it really impressed me. He was doing his job and, uh, and I was very pleased and proud of that. Back home in Hartford, the uh, uh, the news of what I was doing, it was only 70 miles away, uh, got around and uh, my parents took some heat for my actions uh, and my father, who uh, has always been uh, to the day he died, uh, my hero and my best friend, stood up, to, stood up for me uh, to his friends and neighbors and wouldn't let them uh, say one bad word about 
about me over that, or anything else for that matter. Uh, he reserved that right to, for himself. <laughs> In closing, let me say, uh, I want to thank you all, everybody here. And I would say, let's do it again right here in 10 years, but I can't be sure the Great Hall will still be here in 10 years. <laughs>